Goodbye! Hello, Heisman! 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 45. There goes Davis! Oh my God! Davis is going to run it all the way back! Auburn's going to win the football game! Welcome in, everybody, to part three of our Big Ten preview here on the Three Technique College Football Podcast at the intersection of the X's and O's and the Jimmys and the Joes. Trey Reeves, Garrett Turney, I'm Mitch Mason, back with you to close out our Big Ten preview. Thank you so much for all of the support. We would really appreciate it if you would subscribe, like the episode over on YouTube, and follow us at Three Tech Pod on all of our social channels as well. We are just getting started with the conference previews, with talking season, and we'd love to have you along for the ride as part of the Jimmys and the Joes. If you're new here, uh, welcome. First of all, we'd love to have you join the club. We've been uh, previewing the Big Ten. We've got through the first two parts, and uh, about a month ago, we sent out a survey where we had our listeners fill out the power rankings for each of the Power Four conferences. We've been previewing them in reverse power rank standings. So today's episode is teams five through the top team in the conference. All of that and all of our episodes are brought to you by the good brand, homefieldapparel.com. Use our code 3TECHPOD for 15% off if you're a first-time customer or use the link in our bio on all of our social channels to continue to support the show as well. Team number five that we are leading today's episode off with Trey is the USC Trojans. And boy, it has been an interesting tenure for Lincoln Riley out in Hollywood. We were promised national championships. We were promised all that and more with Caleb Williams. And while he did win a Heisman trophy last year, they went eight and five. It felt like a waste of a season. And I tweeted out uh, just a couple of days ago, there are starting to be some grumblings within the USC camp about Lincoln Riley, about if he's up for the job, if he can win at USC heading into the Big Ten Conference. The Trojans may be one of the more fascinating stories of college football this season. Absolutely. And, you know, half the team is championship caliber the first two years. Caleb Williams headed a fantastic offense that had amazing wide receivers, really fun offensive line players, fun running backs. But obviously this, the, the anti-Iowa, right? The, the big story is the lack of defensive success. They have a, they're always going to be a flashy destination, the portal, you know, they picked up bear Alexander last year. That was supposed to be the savior of the defense. They picked up some interesting guys this year. Woody Marks, the running back from Mississippi state, Nate Clifton is kind of the big name on the defensive line this year coming in from Vanderbilt, the Arnold brothers from Oregon state as well. So some interesting pickups, especially on the defensive side of the ball, but you lost a lot of players, right? You lost a lot of interesting guys. Obviously Caleb Williams is the headliner, but Marshawn Lloyd leading rusher from last year that kind of made the rushing attack go on the offensive side of the ball gone. You lost, I know defensive backs are, not going to be a big uh, loss on paper, but Damani Jackson going to Alabama is a big loss. And uh, Tacky Curtis going to Wisconsin uh, as well. But guys, it, it, not to oversimplify it, but it's can DeAnton Lynn, the guy that came in and revolutionized the UCLA defense last year, can he come in and turn this defense around? It's going to decide Lincoln Riley's tenure. I think that was his reset button. I think getting, uh, you know, getting a new defensive coordinator in was the big reset button. That's his big chance to reverse course from d- just a disastrous trend last year. You cannot follow up at USC a New Year's Six Bowl with a 7-5 and five regular season. That just can't happen. So a drastic reverse of course is necessary. Dan Lynn was fantastic at UCLA last year. Their defense was really, really good, much improved. That was his first season ever as a defensive coordinator at any level of football. So color me cautious that he's going to (laughs) come in and be the savior of a defense, even though he was really good last year, 
But, you know, it is I, – I don't think we can get worse than last year. But color me cautious that he's going to be a huge savior of the entire defense this year, especially going into the Big Ten and starting the season with a game against LSU that – presumably rumored you were trying to back out of as recently for two as two years for two for years. He's been trying to get recently out recently as a couple months ago, you were trying to find a replacement in this game. So the vibes are low in Southern California right now. I I'm not going to sit here and tell you that there's a lot to be optimistic about. And for the defensive side of the ball, shoot, even if you have a great defensive coordinator, if he doesn't have the chess pieces to put in the right place, what are we doing? Right. So I'm really interested to see how this season plays out. I think it's playoff or bust for USC. And I think they don't necessarily have the horses to get to the playoff. I'm really interested to see how the USC faithful treat a mediocre season in year three for Lincoln Riley, what that does to the temperature of his seat. But without getting too, you know, projected to what that might be, the crucial stretch, you highlighted this, Mitch, in the write up. It's Washington through Notre Dame on the schedule. And that falls at the very end. That's the month of November at Washington, Nebraska at home at UCLA, Notre Dame at home. That's a tough, tough stretch to close. I think you're looking at, you know, Notre Dame is miles ahead of where USC is right now. If you're just looking at it objectively, but before you get there, looking at the schedule, to me, you're starting with four losses. The, The LSU game in Vegas. I don't know how you could pick USC to win that game right now. Then you go to Michigan. You have uh, Notre Dame at, at the end of the year at home. And you have Penn State at home on October 12th. That's starting the year for, with objectively four teams that are better than you right now. I don't think you see that USC makes a bowl game. I, I, I'm going to go on record saying it in the Big Ten preview. They're over under is seven and a half. They just hit that under last year, if you were paying attention, when they went 7-5. and five. And if you think it's crazy that USC can't go to a bowl game, I refer to you to the 2021 season where they went 4-8. and eight. I know they fired their coach in the middle of that season, but it's possible, guys. It's, it's possible for USC to not be in a bowl game. It's happened in the not-so-recent past. I'm going to go on the record and say that this transition year to the Big Ten is not a fun one for the Trojans. They're starting off on paper for me with four losses. And you're telling me you got to find six wins out of Utah State, Wisconsin, at Minnesota, at Maryland, Rutgers, at Washington, Nebraska, and at UCLA. You got to find six wins there. It's possible if your defense is much improved, but that's a tougher schedule than the one that went seven and five on last year. And I don't think you can argue that. It's, first of all, I love the take. I love the take because I have, I've been, out on USC and then on USC, like last year I said USC would make the playoff for the very same reason, Trey, that you said this year is playoff or bust. Like I felt like Lincoln Riley has to right the ship. Alex Grinch had to figure something out with the defense. Otherwise, heads were on the chopping block. Guess what? He didn't figure it out. He got fired midseason. Uh, I think he's on the Wisconsin coaching staff now, which we forgot to mention that with the Badgers, but that might be the kiss of death. I don't know. Um I've projected USC to lose when they go to Maryland. Rutgers is going to be a plucky team. I know they get them at home. Nebraska is their homecoming game. They do get Nebraska off a bye, but to your point... There's going to be more Nebraska fans at that game than USC fans. I guarantee you that will be true. The The point stands that even if they do make a bowl game, I, I don't think like... Even if they do make a bowl game, your rationale isn't isn't wrong. Right. It's it's the fact that Miller Moss is a talented quarterback. We're not exactly sure what he has around him outside of Woody Marks running the ball. Zachariah Branch is one of the fastest players in the country. That's great. Veteran offensive line. They've got, I believe, uh, three starters coming back. Defensively, though, is just such a gigantic question mark that as we've called out with numerous other Big Ten teams in this preview slate, it would be hypocritical for us to stop that that rubric now with the Trojans just because of their brand name. So I I love the take. I think it's well thought out. I think seven and five, six and six is very realistic, even if they do get a couple of those wins. Uh, But, but the reality is, and and like I mentioned earlier, 
USC faithful feel like they are playing from behind the chains as they join the Big Ten. And I think this season is going to be interesting to look at in the larger picture, but also in a vacuum to see, all right, on a year-to-year basis with the transfer portal, what is Lincoln Riley actually capable of? And, and I don't know that it's winning a national championship anymore. We thought that was possible at Oklahoma, but we haven't really seen that since he left for Hollywood. So USC, uh, we said it off the top. I'll say it again. I think they're one of the most fascinating stories in college football this year, whether or not they reach a bowl game. All right, let's go to number four, and maybe a little bit low on the list for the reigning national champions. The Michigan Wolverines come in fourth in the Jimmy's and Joe's power ranking for the Big Ten Conference. Reigning national champs, they went 15-0 and last year. And Garrett, I want you to help me break them down here. 14th in scoring. They had the top overall defense, the top scoring defense, the top turnover margin as well last season. They were plus 19 in the turnover margin a season ago, they've got a number of those defensive pieces back. Will Johnson is one of the most talented players in the country. He's going to lead that secondary, Um, but they don't have as many returning starters on that defense as I think Michigan fans probably would feel comfortable with, right? Mason Graham's going to lead that defensive line. Game changer. Uh, Will Johnson in in the secondary, Makari Page back there, They're going to be really, really solid. But Michigan, uh, as happens when you win a national championship, you have a lot of guys drafted. On the offensive side, they're replacing a quarterback, uh, and we think it's going to be Alex Orgy that that takes over. You do have Donovan Edwards coming back, Mr. All-World running the football. But again, not that many returning starters on the offensive line, a unit that won the Joe Moore Award a season ago. Question for you is, what does Michigan's swan song look like as Jim Harbaugh heads to the NFL? And we've got a new man in charge. Look, uh, Shromore is going to be a very, very good coach at Michigan. He's going to win a lot of games. He's going to be very successful. He's going to keep the program at the top, but probably not this year. Um, look, at the end of the day, it's hard to repeat as champion. Um, it's It's – you got to have a lot of things go your way to repeat as champion, right? And there's going to be a lot of hurdles for Michigan to do this. Now, I want to pause my yes, they're going to take a step back to say, I don't understand a lot of the the talk about Michigan this offseason as if they're going to completely fall apart. I, I don't get that at all from any standpoint, because especially because of what people have been talking about them, right? They don't have much of a pass attack has been the narrative about Michigan for a while. And let's be fair, they weren't necessarily a dynamic passing attack. I think J.J. McCarthy got way too much hate, but he wasn't all world. He wasn't a massive world beater. He was good at his job. He knew what he needed to do. And now you got a new quarterback and you're saying he's unproven. He's just a big physical guy. And that's all true. Alex Orgy is a physical quarterback who hasn't really shown a propensity to to be able to really throw the football very well. But why, why is that different than the Michigan doesn't have a pass game that, that people have been talking about for a while? Yes. Losing Blake Corum is massive. If you don't know who Donovan Edwards is, you just haven't been watching football and you definitely didn't watch the national championship game uh, this last year, because if you were paying attention at all, uh, he scored a couple times to start that game. And it was, you know, massive here I am moment. It's a big reason why he's on the cover of the new game. So, it, you know, look, Donovan Edwards, I think is going to keep this offense rolling. Yes. They are replacing every starter on their offensive line, with four seniors and the smallest of which I think is like 305. Uh, come on. Like, let's let's not be absurd here. Michigan's still going to have a good offensive line. They're not going to get pushed around. They're going to have to gel. They're going to have to make that work. But I think it's going to be just fine. Yes, they're going to have to find somebody outside at the wide receiver spot to step up. You don't have Roman Wilson anymore. You're going to need to find that guy. Michigan's been trying to find that guy for what seems like, you know, a decade or something like that. They just haven't seemed to really put a great wide receiver out in a while. They've had some real talent and they've had some guys that have played well. Just nobody that's really that big game breaker. I think the the talk about Michigan's defense taking a big step back has to be absurd. Mason Graham's about as good as it comes. Um, you know, you're talking Kenneth Grant up there, Josiah Stewart. These are guys that all played a lot down the stretch. Didn't necessarily sure. start the season as much, but played a lot of football down the stretch and a lot of football in those big games in the playoffs and, and you know, making plays in that Rose Bowl especially. So, you know, when I think about what this Michigan team is going to do, 
Yes, a lot of it has to do with the tough schedule. They play Texas at home week two. That's a huge test. I do not think that's going to be a blowout one way or the other. I think that's going to be a close, relatively low-scoring game, and whoever comes out on top is going to be fine. But you look at the rest of the schedule, you know, obviously you get into the meat of the schedule, USC, Minnesota, at Washington, uh, at Illinois, Michigan State. They do play Oregon at home, uh, and they do go to Ohio State, obviously, to finish the year in the game. They're probably going to lose one or two of those games. I don't think that it's a stretch to say that Michigan can find their way back to 10 wins with a little bit of quarterback development through the year, right? If Alex Orgy can take that step through the year, yes, you might lose to Texas in that second game of the season. But you have until, you know, November, basically, to worry about a real challenge when you play Oregon. Uh, Michigan is one of the best teams in the country. They, I think, have a real good shot at making it back to the playoffs. They will not be the best team in the country this year. That's just, that's not going to be on the table for Michigan. And that's okay. You won your championship. You've been at the top for a while. And you have Sharon Moore at the helm, who I think is going to be a really, really good coach for Michigan for a long time. It's just time to kind of, right, turn the page back over, start to install your, your individual culture, you know, start to install your individual guys, do your recruiting, hit your transfer portal. And I think he's going to do that. It's going to take a little bit of time, but Michigan's going to stay at the top and I think has a real good shot at a playoff this year. He's doing a great job recruiting from the high school ranks uh, right now. More clearly has a vision that he's selling recruits on. So, I, yeah, I but think they're going to be just Harbaugh done. did very well. Harbaugh did not no. recruit very well for some reason. I have no idea how you can be at Michigan and win a bunch and then be like, yeah, we came home with a 26 class. How about that? Well, I think he just flirted with the NFL. For, for way too many years, right? Yeah, wrong about that. yeah, I don't know if kids knew that he was going to be there on a year to year basis. To your point, you know, I, I think when I originally wrote the preview, I think I was a little hypercritical of Michigan. I still don't know what their offense is going to look like in totality. Like, one of the big questions is who's catching passes, right? I believe yeah. they have something like 35 total receptions coming back. Um, and, and that's even with Colson Leveland, who I believe is hurt for a portion of last year back on the roster uh, as, as you're starting tight end. So and he has a chance to be one of the best tight ends in the country. So he, like, does. Like, you know, he will catch passes, but you're right. Like who's the wide receiver that's going to step up. Uh, wait, we'll wait and see. Yeah. So it's going to be, should be a ground and pound offense for Michigan, which is just fine. The defense is great. I think 10 and two is, is a great plateau. That means you probably lose to Texas and in Oregon um, and maybe beat, Ohio State on the road, right? Like if you can just lose two of those three games, very successful season, you got a chance to go back into the playoff, get hot, see what happens uh, as you control the the ground game and, and hobby, um, excuse me, hopefully stifle teams uh, with that defense. So Michigan might be a small step back, like you said, but they're not going anywhere as far as national relevance goes. Number three on our list this year is the Penn State Nittany Lions. And Trey, I have been out on the Nittany Lions a little bit this offseason because I've just been, frankly, so frustrated with the way that Jim Frank, uh, James Franklin has managed his team over the last few years. I made a point a couple of episodes ago that I worried that the true championship window has closed for Penn State, at least for a little bit. Not the playoff window, not the relevancy window, heck, not even a chance to go win a Big Ten championship, but a team that can truly win the national championship. I just felt like they had a better chance to do that the last couple of years than what they might have going forward. Certainly with Oregon joining the conference, we'll see what happens with Michigan over the long term. But man, Drew Aller was supposed to be the truth. And then even though their offense was 12th in scoring, which you look at their offensive stats and you compare that with what they did in like big games and it's it's really hard to kind of reconcile some of those stats, right? 12th in scoring, 53rd in total offense feels about right, but the defense was so good. Third in scoring, first in rushing defense, second in total defense, second in turnover margin. The fact that they went 10 and three and got their clocks cleaned by Ole Miss in the bowl game, it's just, it's got me feeling a little bit wary about this team. They took a small transfer class. It's an impactful one. Uh, I really like the transfer corners that they took. Jalen Kimber comes over from Florida. AJ Harris comes over from Georgia. So they're replacing some secondary that they've lost over the past couple of years. Julian Fleming 
is a, a former five-star wide receiver who comes over to pair now with uh, with Drew Aller. And they've got Luke Reynolds, the top tight end in the country from the high school ranks, joining the fold as well. So the offensive skill, I think, is in a really good spot. For me, my frustration is just what do they do in, in the big games? And they lost, they lost some of that production. Uh, Dante Cephas is gone. Chop Robinson, gone to the NFL. Olu Fashanu, gone to the NFL up front. Caden Wallace, another guy that's off the board in the NFL draft. Then they lose, as I mentioned, Dante Cephas, uh, transfers to K-State, never really worked out with him at the wide receiver position. And Keandre Lambert-Smith transfers out post-spring ball down to Auburn. So for a championship contender, there's just, it feels like a few pieces, a few puzzle pieces that are still missing. I think the defense is going to be fine, but I don't know that I trust that offense enough to get me over the finish line, to go win a national championship. Yeah. I mean, go go ahead. ahead. Man, I, I'm interested in Penn State this year. Let me paint a rosy picture for you and maybe get you back on the bandwagon here a little bit because okay. – Two new coordinators, Tom Allen, the defensive coordinator, replaces Manny Diaz, yep. and Andy Kotelnicki, who is one of my favorite offensive coordinators in all of college football coming up from Kansas. Yep. I am fascinated by that selection because I trust him as an offensive coordinator. I'm very, very interested to see what the vision is with the Jimmys and Joes that Penn yep. State has on the field because it seems like – to me, you look at what Kansas did on offense for the last couple of years, lots of zone reads, lots of quarterback run game. Drew Allard certainly can run the ball. He's certainly talented talented enough to do it. I don't know that he's as good as what Kansas has put on the field with Daniels and Bean the last couple of years at running something like that. But it's going to be fascinating to me if that can click and if Penn State can find a true alpha wide receiver one, look out. Because I think that that's going to be the missing piece that you're talking about. Just competent play calling, using the guys that they have. Interested to see how it meshes. But if they can find an alpha wide receiver one, I know the run game is going to be good. I know the offensive line is going to be pretty good. That's just going to be kind of as we expected. But Drew Aller takes care of the football. And he makes good decisions. And I think you can expect a jump from him in year two as a starter. I, I'm fully expecting him to be better this year, maybe yeah. challenge downfield a little bit more, maybe push the tempo just a little bit more, just right. be a little bit more exciting on offense. That's what I'm hoping for for Drew Aller this year, and I think you'll get that with Kotelnicki coming in as the offensive coordinator. Yeah, They also might have the easiest schedule in the entire Big Ten. It's, it's very easy. I like what you said about making the offense exciting. They got so predictable in big moments, and I know Nick Singleton – is an awesome back. But man, when you couldn't open up holes for him against Ohio State and Michigan, Penn State really didn't have much else to throw at those elite defenses. So yeah, some creativity, some different looks, maybe getting Drew Aller out of the pocket, make him more comfortable this year. That's key for Penn State. I know I started this off like I was attending a funeral, but you mentioned the key here. It's a very easy schedule. This should be at minimum a 10-win ball club. West Virginia is a tricky opener. Uh, that's in Morgantown. Uh, that's a morning kick, thank, or I guess a, a noon kick for them in the Eastern time zone. If that was at night, we might be having a conversation about Penn State starting 0-1. After that, though, it's a very cushy schedule. Their next real test is probably at USC, October the 12th, uh, and that's their critical stretch that I highlighted in the preview. At USC, a bye week, at Camp Randall to play Wisconsin. Ohio State and Washington. That's the toughest stretch on their schedule. They do finish up with Maryland as a home game uh, on November 30th. But, you know, you look up and down that schedule, and I just have a hard time believing that they lose more than two games. So this really should be a 10 win ball club minimum. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Um, the road trips in the Big Ten are USC, Wisconsin, Purdue, and Minnesota. That That's it. And I, I think that that's manageable. If you ask James Franklin to draw up a better schedule, maybe he removes Ohio State on November 2nd and, you know, they somehow avoid Ohio State, Oregon, and Michigan. That's maybe the only thing that he would probably change. All right. So 
So we'll see. Ball's in James Franklin's court. I feel like this is legacy time for him. He's He's got to find a way to make this 12-team playoff. Otherwise, I, I just feel like the folks at Happy Valley are going to going to have to come up with another plan. If we're missing 12 team playoffs at Penn State, boy, that that would not be good. So 10 wins minimum and uh come on, restore the faith. Uh, I'm happy to jump back on the bandwagon, but I, I need I need some signs of life here. I feel like I'm being held hostage right now by uh by the Penn State offense. Trey Ohio State is number 2 on our preseason poll. Tell me why Ohio State will or won't win the national championship. I've got my takes about them, but I want to kind of hear from you where you land with the Buckeyes. And we'll hear later at the very end of this episode, Jake from the walk on red shirts joins us as well. Yeah. I won't go too deep into Ohio state. Cause I think Jake did a great job, you know, breaking that down for us, but I'll ask you, Mitch, what was the thing that held Ohio state back last year? Uh, it was a quarterback play. I think it was the quarterback play. I think most observers would say it as well. They had, an underrated defense, if that's possible, yeah. um, being the third in total defense. I think no one was talking about how good that uh, Ohio State defense, at least, you know, they're being compared to Michigan, who was maybe one of the best college defenses of all time. But that Ohio State defense last year was nasty in year two of uh, Jim Knowles up there. So I think that, you know, defensive side of the ball is great. Quarterback play held him back. To me, it's as simple as was Will Howard the right selection in the transfer portal. Yeah. And if he was, you're going to be winning a national championship. If he wasn't, you're going to be struggling to win the Big Ten. You might lose to Michigan again, and Ryan Day might be fired. That seems drastic, but when we talk to actual Ohio State fans, that's the pulse that I get. It's national championship or bust, and a lot of them are expecting a big uptick in play at the quarterback position. Um replacing Ryan Day, or not Ryan Day, that's the head coach, but coming in with Will Howard at, uh, maybe it's a little bit of a Freudian slip. With I was going to say. But, uh, you know, coming in with Will Howard coming over from Kansas State, because every other position is locked and loaded. The running back position with Quinshawn Judkins and Travion Henderson. Yep. The wide receiver position we know is always going to be good at Ohio State. The defense is loaded at every position, front end to back end. Can the bus driver drive the bus? That That's really, I hate to oversimplify these things, but it really seems that simple to me going into the season. I, I think you're right. I think at minimum, if Will Howard can be a steward of the offense, Ohio State's ceiling is a national championship contender. If he can be an X factor amidst all of that talent with such a great offensive line, with the running backs that they have in Judkins and Henderson, Mecca Buka, Jeremiah Smith is a guy that uh, is maybe the most hyped up freshman wide receiver we've had in a long time. Jake talks about him in just a minute. Like all of the weapons are there. All of the excuses are gone for Ohio State not to win a national championship game. If Will Howard can be the guy, there's no, there's no team in my mind that's going to prevent them. Not even Georgia, not Oregon, that's going to prevent them from winning a national championship this season. A couple years ago, when they hired Jim Knowles, I said that is the key piece. That's what Ohio State's been missing, right? Their defense at one point was a liability. That's what held the Buckeyes back. Now it's the strength of their team, and they're projected to be the top overall defense going into 2024. Caleb Downs transfers up from Alabama. I mean, they are, it's an embarrassment of riches up there in Columbus, Ohio. Let's look at the schedule. And and you tell me you tell me where there's a loss on this schedule. Maybe it's October 12th at Oregon, right? That's pretty much it. That's Iowa's, the most likely. That that's that's the one that's the most likely. Right. You've got Iowa right before, so maybe a little look ahead situation. Uh, and and hopefully the Hawkeyes don't catch Ohio State napping. But a- after that, you get Nebraska off a of bye week. You do go to Penn State, and Penn State. As you'll hear Jake talk about, Penn State does play Ohio State difficult, but again, you probably should win that game. And then you've got Michigan at the end of the year. Like at minimum, I think you are allowed you're allowed one loss on this schedule, but at minimum, eleven and one and going to Indianapolis for the Big Ten championship game, that's that's my expectation. Yeah, I think you know, a worst case scenario is losing the two road games. I think that's the main thing you could argue that. Maybe Penn State and Oregon are just raucous road environments that rattle you, but 
if Ryan Day's teams are getting rattled in his seventh year on the road, that's a problem with the amount of talent that he has. So I think you're right. I think they should expect nothing less than 11 and one up in Columbus and a Big Ten championship appearance and probably a Big Ten championship win in a game that's going to be against probably Penn State or Oregon, um, a rematch in one of those. And if you lose one, I think you're forgiven if you beat them in the Big Ten championship game. Exactly. Exactly my thought. They're my national championship pick. Uh, I love the Buckeyes this year. They're number two in the Jimmys and Joes power ranking. Garrett, let's go to the top team. According to our listeners, that would be the Oregon Ducks coming over from the Pac-12. They were beat twice by Washington last year, spoiled Bo Nix's finale uh, with the Ducks. But this is a team that is locked and loaded and ready for a title contention. They've got Dylan Gabriel at quarterback. They've got a bevy of offensive and defensive weapons that they mine from the transfer portal. Dan Lanning was rumored to maybe be leaving for Alabama this offseason. He posts a video saying the grass is greener in Eugene. How high are you on the Ducks this season? Man, I got to tell you what, when I saw that Oregon was the top team from the Jimmys and Joes, I initially was just like, nah, man, that's Ohio State, right? They're the best team in the conference, maybe the best team in the country. They have no excuses, everything y'all just talked about. And then I kind of sat and thought about it, and I'm like, you know what? They The Jimmys and Joes might be right on this one. They, they might have actually nailed this. And I think it comes down to just a couple of things for Oregon that makes a difference, right? I think everything that you want to talk about in terms of, you know, advantages that Ohio State has, you can almost say the exact same thing for Oregon, right? They have dynamic wide receivers. I really, really like what they have coming in with Evan Stewart. I think he's going to be a stud. We did not see anything close to his ceiling at Texas A&M. He's going to be awesome up there. He's going to pair with uh, Tez Johnson really well. Uh, you know, I'm thinking about Jordan James at the running back spot, a really, really solid back, surprisingly powerful, decent breakaway speed. And, oh, yeah, by the way, Dylan Gabriel turns out to be maybe the best quarterback in the country this year. Uh, he, he's extremely dynamic. Uh, you know, we've seen what they've been able to put up up there in Oregon. Um, we saw what they did with Bo Nick's career. I mean, and, and, and it just seems like, man, like it's it's been a long couple of years since they got trounced by Georgia to start, you know, the landing tenure there in Oregon. It's been a long couple of years since then. Uh, and, and that's a good thing, right? It feels like that was, you know, five, six years ago and that Oregon's been a completely different team since then. They turned this program around quick. They brought in so much from the portal. Love Jabbar Muhammad coming over from Washington. I know Washington fans are going to hate that, right? They're just going to despise that pick. But I, I personally love it from Oregon. I love going and taking your rival's best player. <laughs> um, I, I think it's a lot of fun. And look, I think the places where you get the advantage over Ohio State for Oregon, right? Because this is ultimately what we're talking about. You're, you're, you're talking about really just finding those fine details. I think Dylan Gabriel is better than what they're going to have in Will Howard. Will Howard's going to be a good quarterback, but I think Dylan Gabriel is just that much more dynamic. He can do stuff with his feet. He can make every throw on the field. And I think the one real big advantage they have this season is they play Ohio State at home. Autzen is not an easy place to win. That's a loud stadium for how big it is. And I think that they're going to be going nuts for what I think will be the best game of the year. I think the best game we're going to see this year is Oregon hosting Ohio State right there in the middle of October. It's going to be a fun one to watch. Whoever wins that clearly has the inside track to win the whole thing, not just the conference. Yes, we're talking about the national championship game. And I think Oregon at home gets the advantage there. They're going to have to win the big games. That's been something they haven't quite been able to do under Dan Lanning, right? Couldn't quite beat Washington last year. And that's that's a problem, right? But you can turn that problem right back around on Ryan Day with everything y'all just talked about, not beating Michigan in that big game. So, Really, this is going to be a sort of who blinks first in the big spot between them and Ohio State. Right now, that game has got to be decided by just the thinnest of margins. And when you have the thinnest of margins, give me the dynamic quarterback to go up on top of it. I think Oregon's probably going to end up being one of the better teams this year. Uh, certainly the best team, I think, in the Big Ten by just that much. Uh, oh, yeah. and, and I do think that they will end up in one of those top four spots after winning the conference in year one. So do you have Oregon uh, running the the gauntlet then and going 12-0? I, I think they go 13-0 winning the Big Ten, wow. and I think they're going to take the top overall seed over Georgia, over whoever wow. else they here. Wow. I, Oregon's a very good football team, and here's the one thing that I think is different. Oregon, I think, has to be one of the more motivated teams in the country right now. That Dan Lanning is just young. 
He's got kind of that like hothead, wants to go after it, wants to rub it in your face. I don't think he liked the coaching rumor stuff. I don't think he liked that at all. And Oregon wants to win. I, I Oregon wants to tell all the haters, y'all all trashed us. We just watched Washington almost win the whole thing. You know, that they don't want to watch their rival go do that. They're coming over new conference. Oh, come join the big boys. And there's a little bit of a condescension there. And so I think a lot of people are going to sleep on the Ducks a little bit. And I think they're going to come out and just start exploding. You know, the thing that I think is big for them is they get a lot of time to kind of get their feet wet, right? They get a lot of time to go Idaho, Boise State. And that's a good Boise State team, but they're better than Boise State, and they're playing them at home. Oregon State, that's going to be a, a shell of what it was last year. You get the bye week early, UCLA, Michigan State, and then you play Ohio State. You get easy teams to start your schedule before you can finally go and hit Ohio State in the face. And then it's, you know, Purdue, Illinois, at Michigan. Could be tricky at the big house. I think they're better than Michigan. Maryland, Wisconsin, another bye week right before they go to Washington. Or they don't go to Washington. They play the game in Oregon. But this is a, a you know, tough schedule for most teams, but not Oregon. I, I think realistically they're only going to drop one game, and it's if Ohio State can find a way to pull off the hero ball move. Right now, though, I'm going to go with the experience and the dynamicism of Dylan Gabriel. I think – They've got a really good team. They've got a seriously underrated cast of characters on that offense. And we're going to start saying a bunch of their names pretty quick because because those guys are going to be a lot of fun. This could be that big breakout team that, you know, it seems like every year there's a team that was like kind of okay and then jumps. I think that could be Oregon this year. I, I love it. I, I love that take. Trey, I, you you seem surprised as, as I was to hear that Oregon was going to run the gauntlet. Uh do you have them going undefeated? Where do you have them maybe losing a game? I mean, they draw they draw Ohio State and Michigan. They play at Michigan. Running the gauntlet would be amazing. I think they would absolutely deserve the number one overall seed if they were able to do that. Georgia runs the gauntlet with their schedule. They might have something to say about that. But sure. I think I, I see them slipping up at least once. I don't know where. I think they're going to be a really tough out in the playoff. We probably see them in the final four when yeah. they make it into the playoff because I think Dylan Gabriel is that good. Going to be really similar to what they had in Bo Nix last year, and the receivers are going to be impossible for anybody to cover. So if they can figure out the defense, if they can you know, just be consistent on the defensive side of the ball, which Dan Lanning obviously has a good track record of that, it's going to be really hard to see more than one loss for them. I, yeah, I think it's I think it's hard to see more than one loss. I think they either get Ohio State at home or they uh, or they they either drop Ohio State at home or they drop Michigan on the road. But I don't think they drop both of them, right? So yeah. you know, eleven and one I think is the most realistic scenario. It's funny when I wrote the preview, the over under is ten and a half. The under was the slight favorite. Uh, so uh, the, the the betting public was taking the Ducks to go ten and two. Here, maybe maybe part of I'm, what you're saying where they're being a little slept on. I, I'm just gonna tell you, look, they're you know me. I got the Michigan shirt right here. They're better than Michigan. They're not gonna lose that game outside of like you know big injuries or something like that. They're not gonna lose that game. Um, and look, like Ohio State, that's gonna be a tough game either way. Like that's for me, that's as close to a coin flip as you could possibly make it. All yeah. I'm gonna tell the rest of the college football world is sleep on the Ducks at your own peril. Okay, the, the this ain't your mama's Ducks team. You know, this, this this is a different Ducks team. And, like, think about it like this. This is kind of like another little place where I think they could have the edge. Dan Lanning versus Ryan Day. Who do you think has the slight better killer instinct? I feel like I'm going Dan Lanning on this one. He just seems like a killer. He looks like the guy who says, like, I'm not just going to beat you by 30. I'm going to keep trying to score. I want to keep doing this. He's not the guy who's like, oh, I got to, like, play smart here at the end of the game to try to, like, conserve time. Or so he's going to go for the kill shot because he wants to not just beat you, but he wants to beat you decisively. It has backfired on him. That backfired on him against Washington last year. But I think that killer instinct ends up winning out this year. And I think it'll end up being the, the, the thing that helps push them over the top against Ohio State. Look, if, if they lose to Ohio State, fair game, right? Like, that's that's a very good Ohio State team. I'm not trying to take anything away from that. That They've got a crazy good team. And they also have that kind of thing where they can warm up on their schedule too, right? Get some of their younger guys adjusted to the game. I just think there's a little bit more that I trust with Oregon right now and a little bit more I think can go high. I think the ceiling's a little bit higher for Oregon. It's a very high ceiling. It's a sky-high ceiling. I, I can't wait. The game of the year. 
to me is Saturday, October the 12th, Ohio State and Oregon. Um, Absolutely. That, that will be must-see TV. If you can only watch one game for all of the year, that that honestly might be it. I just feel like that's such a preview of a national championship or the, the absolute best that we have in college football. Kind of funny to be saying that um, outside of the SEC. I know the game has been really good the last couple of years, but to just for me, for my instinct, to immediately go the game of the year, is Oregon Ohio State? I said I think says a lot where where that conference is has come. So anyway, we have we've done it. We've previewed all eighteen teams in the Big Ten Conference. We're gonna kick it over to my sit down with Jake from the Walk On Red Shirts. And uh, the next time we talk to you guys, we will be previewing the SEC. So until then, enjoy my conversation over the Ohio State Buckeyes with Jake. All right, I've got Jake from the Walk On Red Shirts joining us for this Ohio State portion of the preview. And Jake, uh, glad to have you on. Appreciate uh, you having me. To, yeah, excited to talk Ohio State football with you. Uh, this insert comes at the end of the episode where we've previewed the top five Big Ten opponents uh, this season. And Ohio State, according to our community, came in at number two behind Oregon. Now, uh for me, that was a little bit of a surprise considering Ohio State is my national champion here in the preseason. I'm projecting them to be the number one team all year long and to finally get it done. So first reaction that I want from you is to Ohio State being number two behind Oregon. Fair, foul, somewhere in between? Uh, I actually think it's fair. Like, I don't think it's that unreasonable because, I mean, you know, we're talking about Ohio State, but Oregon is loaded. It's not like it's a clear cut one and you know number one and then everybody else. You know, Oregon did load up. There are a lot of questions about Ohio State, and I think there is almost over the last couple of years of just people being tired about hearing about Ohio State of thinking like every year, oh, this is the year, and then they don't get it done. You know, they lost to Michigan three straight years. You know, they were so close to being Georgia, they're a missed field goal away from probably being a national champion. If we're being yeah. honest. You know, they've had incredibly talented teams and fallen short the last couple of years. And it's okay to say that because they have. 2020 was a weird year. They make it to the national championship. Pro in a full season, I think that team might look a little different. I don't know if they make it to the national championship. I think that team makes a little bit different noise. And Ohio State just didn't have a good defense in 2020. But now, you know, you look at this team and defense is like the bread and butter of the 2024 Ohio State team. Totally agree. I said it when Jim Knowles uh, came over from Oklahoma State. I felt like that was the piece that had been missing over the past couple of seasons. And, and now it really feels like Ohio State has built not just a solid defense, but a monster on defense, right? Uh, projecting to be the best defense in the country mm -hmm. heading into 2024. I love the chaos that Knowles' system brings with it. The pass rush should be very good for Ohio State. So, uh, tell me, let's start then on the defensive side of the ball. What do you like most for the Buckeyes this year? And does it have anything to do with a certain safety that uh, has come north? Yeah, uh, I, I think the secondary it should be clear in a way, uh, if not the best secondary in the country, top three, without a doubt. Denzel Burke could have went pro, probably would have been a top two round pick. Jordan Hancock does not get a lot of love. You know, he played a slot corner, played a little bit outside last year, uh, was a really highly recruited guy and suffered some injuries. But last year, his first year healthy, played a huge role. Uh, Davison Igbenosa was a freshman All-American at you know Ole Miss, transferred up, and just plays with a little bit different swagger, plays you know gritty, just wants to punch you in the mouth basically every play and isn't really afraid if he's going to get penalized. Uh, then you go out to the safeties, and I mean, the key one right there is Caleb Downs. I mean – He's already be considered one of the best defenders in the country. He was a true freshman last year. Obviously, transfers out of Alabama. You know, everybody in the country wanted him. Um, you know, he was seriously considering Ohio State when coming out of high school. I mean, this secondary doesn't get much better. Lathan Ransom has been a finalist for the Thorpe Award or a semifinalist for the Thorpe Award the last couple of years. You've got a ton of talent on that back end which is kind of funny when you talk about the Big Ten because there's not a lot of teams that throw the ball very well. There's a lot more run heavy. But it really feels like Ohio State, ever since really the Urban Meyer era, 
was building the team to be just good enough in the Big Ten and then be able to compete with the Clemson and the Georgias and the Alabamas because if they played the Big Ten style, you saw this kind of switch in Michigan. The first couple of years, they played that Big Ten style and then they were losing into TCU. They were losing to Georgia. They had to switch that mentality a, a little bit. And it feels like this is why they have this stout secondary. It's it's a star-studded secondary. I can't wait for them to go to work. And, and certainly, I think when we look towards maybe the, the game against Oregon, that's, I think, going to be the game of the year mm -hmm. on a lot of people's radars. We'll get there in just a moment. But flip the script over to the offensive side for me. And let me ask you this. Is heading into 2024 – who is more important to the offense? Chip Kelly is the architect or Will Howard as your new quarterback? I think Chip Kelly plays a much bigger role. This is the first time Ryan Day is taking his hand off of the play calling since he's become the head coach. And if Will Howard fails and they you know, take him back, I think Devin Brown can do enough to keep them at the level. They're, they're stars all over the team. Mm -hmm. It's not going to fall down on just one quarterback. So I think Will Howard is important. I think he's obviously the quarterback. But how much does Ryan Day actually let Chip Kelly just call the offense? Does he ever step in? Does Chip Kelly start calling bad plays? Like, is he early in the season? Like, they don't really have many tests, but is there a couple questionable decisions early in the year where you have to think, like, I don't know about this. Maybe we need to reevaluate. Chip Kelly's scheme and making sure that he gets the right players, the ball at the right time. I mean, you've got Travion Henderson and Quinshawn Judkins. Like, you, you've got to get them the ball somehow. Those are two star-studded running backs. You've got Jeremiah Smith, who is probably the most hyped freshman receiver in the last 10 years, I would say. Yeah. I, I can't think of another freshman wide receiver the last 5, 10 years that has come in with this much hype where they're already basically saying he's going to have 1,000 yards his freshman year. Right. Yeah, it's it's uh it's insane the amount of hype there. You know, like the new EA college football game, right? They made a point of saying that there are no limit to the impact players that can be on either side of the ball. I haven't played the game yet. Obviously, it's we're a day away from public release, but uh, I feel like Ohio State could legitimately have like six or seven impact players mm -hmm. at any one time on either side of the ball. Uh, it's it's just an embarrassment of riches. It's a roster that is built to break stereotypes, in my opinion, for Ryan Day. Um, you know, the, the team is, a lot of the guys on the team are saying it's national championship or bust. It feels like nationally, from someone who's not a Buckeyes fan, that, uh, you know, the the pressure cooker up there in Columbus, it's either going to make a gym or it's going to spit Ryan Day out on, on the other side. I'm intrigued to see which side of that coin we get in 2024 as uh, Ohio State is a national title contender but now let's move over to the schedule. And I mentioned that game uh, at Oregon. That's not the first test. I think Iowa coming uh, to the shoe the week before is probably that first real challenge that Ohio State is going to face. But as you look through the 2024 calendar, what are kind of your initial expectations? And do you just immediately center on that game at Oregon? Or are you wary of other games on the schedule? Yeah, Iowa's a great point there. I mean, we know Iowa's offense has been terrible. They've got a new offensive coordinator who may or may not just be just a hair above Brian Ferentz. Yeah. Michigan State at Michigan State. I'm interested to see what Jonathan Smith does. I don't think they're going to be very good, but it wouldn't shock me with Aiden Childs and whatnot if there's a little bit of a you know, coming out party where Jonathan Smith tries to make a you know statement in that game. Um, now that is the fourth game of the season for Ohio State if they caught him in like Game one, game two, you know, maybe you're talking different there. Game four, you're hoping your quarterbacks are all figured out. You've got your offense figured out. That Nebraska game could be interesting because Nebraska's got an easy schedule. They could be 7-0. and Now, I don't think Dylan Rayola is going to come into Columbus and beat Ohio State, you know, towards the end of October. Penn State always plays Ohio State tough. Like, every single time, that is a tough game. Ohio State fans cannot look past that because Drew Aller's in year two. That defense should still be really good. And then obviously in the end of the year, you've got Michigan, you know, at home. Uh, in my mind, it's just really a three-game schedule with a couple other, I guess, potentials. But a lot of potential games are at home. Iowa is at home. Nebraska is at home. Going on the road at Oregon, going on the road at Penn State and home versus Michigan. 
if they go two and one in that stretch, they should be playing in Indianapolis at the end of the year, and they'll have a slot guaranteed into the 12 team playoff. Yeah, exactly. That's those are my thoughts as well. I think you're allowed one slip up in this. It's not an easy schedule per se. You might even be allowed two slip ups with it because if they their two losses are Oregon and Michigan, ten and two, they might still be ranked tenth in the country and still have a spot in there. Now that's an interesting point. So I think Ohio State would certainly have a, a justification to be in the twelve team playoff. But if you slip up again to the Michigan Wolverines, a team that I think I expect at least to take a little bit of a step back. We don't know what they're going to do with the quarterback position. They are loaded defensively, but still, it's a long schedule. Uh, Jim Harbaugh is off to the NFL. There's just some unknowns uh, that I think are, are very real considerations for Michigan. So if Ohio State is to drop to Michigan again, what would that do to Ryan Day, the program, if anything? There's a lot of people that make hot takes on Twitter and all over social media and all over the internet. I think Ryan Day, the only way anything happens is if he doesn't make the playoff. I don't think anything else really matters. As much as they want to go out there and hoot and holler and say their first goal is beat Michigan, the second goal is win the Big Ten, third goal is win the national championship. Ultimately, if you win that third goal, nobody cares about the other two. <laughs> nobody cares about the other two. In 2021, if they had, or 2022, if they had beaten Georgia and won the national championship, would they care if they lost to Michigan that year? I mean, it would still sting, but they would have the trophy. So ultimately, that's all that matters. So if they lose two games and one of them happens to Michigan, I think he's fine. Like, I know that they've invested a ton of resources. NIL, you can talk all about how Caleb Downs and Quinshawn Judkins and Seth McLaughlin all ended up at Ohio State. I know that the NIL plays a big portion. But this fan base is too passionate to all of a sudden say, you know what? We're going to take back, back all of our money that we've been giving you, and we want to we want to see you do it yourself. In the day of NIL, especially with revenue sharing at this coming at this point, it, it would take a significant step back from Ryan Day to actually get fired. And the question then is, who are you going to put in this position to do that? Urban Meyer is not coming back. You're not going to go out and get Nick Saban. I mean, you're not going to bring a Steve Sarkeesian up there. You're not going to bring Mike Norvell up there as much as it is a top tier job. If you're firing a guy for going 11 and one or 10 and two, it's not as attractive as people think. Yeah, I, I hear you right there. I am also of the camp that uh, I think a lot of people are just overreacting, but you know, we'll, we'll see. I mean, college athletics is, is fast and furious and things happen all the time. But uh, end of the day, if my prediction's right, they're not going to have to worry about it because they're going to be the last team standing at the end of this season. Anyway, uh, Jake, last question I have for you as an Ohio state fan, is it nice to just assume that you're going to be in the playoff and, and maybe even, you know, make it to the national championship game? Cause that's a feeling I'm not familiar with. So if you went back, I forget how many years, I think if you went back to basically the beginning of the urban Meyer era, so it's 2011 and they did a 12 team playoff every year, Ohio state would have never missed the 12 team playoff. That's fun. So <laughs> and if you want to go back even further, I think if you go back to about 2002, I think they only miss it twice. I think 2004 and 2010, or I guess 2011, would have been the only two times that they would have missed it um, since they won their championship in 02. Because every other time, they were basically finished in the top 10 in some way, shape, or form. I mean, they backdoored their way into making the national championship against LSU in 07. They played for a national championship, you know, in 06 against Florida. Trail prior teams were finishing the top 10. So I don't want to say the regular season isn't as interesting to me. I mean, knowing that there's going to be some new teams, although they only get Oregon out of the new Pac-12, I think that makes it a little bit more challenging when you've got Oregon, Washington, and USC coming into town. Because if you took those three out, Ohio State would be <laughs> – they would be walking into the playoff every single year without question. Well, must be nice. Soak it up. Don't <laughs> don't don't let that feeling ever ever lose its. Oh bias. no, nope. I, I, I trust me. I still get nervous for every game, and I I get anxious. And yep. except Akron, when they're a fifty-one point favorite, if they lose that one, then I'll probably just go jump off a bridge. Yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. That might that might be the end of the sport up in the the great state of Ohio. Yes. Uh, well, Jake, we appreciate you jumping on. Uh, excited to have you on. Uh, for 
Big Ten preview. We're excited to continue to preview the rest of the college football slate as well. We've got the SEC coming up next. Make sure you tune into all of our channels at 3 Tech Pod uh, to uh, get your preseason content. Subscribe over at the uh, Walk on Red Shirts as well. Follow Jake, William, all of their adventures. And uh, point being, we're all college football fans. We've got a lot of great content coming up as talking season rolls along. Well, for all of us here at the 3 Technique, thanks so much for hanging out with us. Until next time, so long, everybody. Gracious, yeah. how about that?